Welcome back to Live with the Mod, the Poet Powered by Revolution of One, where we have the greatest guests and most powerful conversations. And today is no different. Today, we got a very special guest on the program with us today, man. This brother is a film director and producer, man, photographer, all around creative. We got the good brother, Sean Antoine the second on the show with us today. How you doing today, family? I'm feeling great, brother. I'm, I'm extremely grateful to be here. Um, I, I admire all of the work that you do and, uh, I wish you a continued success in the near future. I appreciate that, my brother. I appreciate you making time, man. Like this is this is huge for me, and I, I really appreciate just having a few moments to talk with you and share some information and light with the audience, man. Because I know you got a whole interesting perspective, man. I love talking to creatives in general, but before we get into the uh, creative conversation, I wanted to talk to you about uh, college. I saw that you um ended up enrolling again, going back and uh, what you're going back for your master's. Yes, I'm in. Uh, okay. Grad school right now for uh, my master's in fine arts and in documentary media at Northwestern University. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in your side of town, man. I'm in the Midwest. Yeah. So yeah, what, what, what prompted that, man? What prompted what, what like motivate? Because you're already in the space, man. You're already in the yeah. industry. So, but what prompted that? Well, you know, it, it's for me, it's never been a problem to be in the industry and to be working. Mm-hmm. Um, but for many of the things that I aspire to do, it's really relied on me being independent and me creating my own works mm. and the opportunity to be back in school and to learn from people that have created numerous projects, been in tons of spaces where they're independently representing themselves was something that uh, really drew me into wanting to go back to school, wanting to learn um, and even more so me wanting to really dive into being a, a master of the craft and um, you know, the opportunity to be at one of the top 10 universities in the world in Northwestern was um, an opportunity that I really couldn't pass on. Um, you talk about building generational wealth, setting the standard for like my future family and the opportunity to go to a school like that is uh, something that I know is going to pay its dividends. Hopefully 50 years from now, hundred years from now, my family will be like, well, Grandpa, granddad, great granddad. He went to Northwestern. He was a mm-hmm. film. He did these amazing things. He got a chance to be in Chicago. I'm from Harlem. So the chance to be in a city like Chicago with so much black history really drew me in. And um, it really is something that, you know, I'm looking forward to. And I'm I'm just grateful to be experiencing now. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you talk about from a creative perspective, who was it like a couple people that inspired you to do like the art that you do it? Or if it was like, if you could give me like three creatives that you would say, like, man, these people really inspire me. I I, I see you post Kanye sometimes here and there. And, yeah. and I know he's definitely like one of my goats in terms of just being a creative. But who would you say is like your top three creatives that you just love their work? Um, how they think? I would say my top three creatives would definitely be. Ye is in the mix. Um, Spike Lee. Mm. And, and the last person I would say is definitely. And hear me out here. I think he's not only a intellectual, but also creative. I would say Malcolm X. Um, mm. Ability to transform in spaces, um, his sharpness, um, and even his ability to really um, communicate with people with getting his mm. message across. That's why I feel he's one of the people that really stand out to me. Yeah, that's deep, bro. That's deep. Because a lot of people don't understand that that's a talent in itself, being able to convey a message and to make people feel what you're saying, like he makes people feel what, what, what he's saying. And it's just like, it, it's, and it's like, you can go in front of a different audience and in a certain amount of time, you just know what they need, know what they want to hear. And then, you know, what you want to convey to them. And you just like the deliver delivering it in a certain type of way that really touches them, man. That's a skill. That's an art in itself, man. I, I feel like once you do everything with enough intention, it can become an art, you know, <laughs> And that's why I say, like, I believe like all of us as artists in a way, you know, because everything can become art if if you do it with the right intention and, and, and the right passion to it. Um, but 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 I wanted to ask you about um this this hashtag that I see you do a lot, my ancestors' wildest dreams. What what does that mean to you, bro? What does that mean to you? Well, for me, um, ancestors' wildest dreams was something I saw. Um, I can't really remember where I saw it on social media years ago. And it was something that really stood out to me as far as um, understanding where our ancestors came from. And even more than that, understanding that, you know, 
I'm a representation and that their efforts and all the opportunities that they didn't have um, can hopefully exist in me. So every time I do something, I understand that it's not because of me. It's um, hopefully I'm paying tribute and paying homage to those that came before me. So um, Ancestors Wild Your Dream is just really to keep me grounded and understand that although I'm here and I'm doing these things as an individual, I have 10,000 ancestors that are behind me and came before me and paved that way. So that's why I use the slogan ancestors, wildest dreams. And I think it's just something for me as, you know, being quote unquote, a foundational black American, somebody that's Mm -hmm. from here, um, understanding that our ancestors paved the way through their bloodshed, through their hard work, through their innovation, and even more than that, their courage. So when I think of what my ancestors did for me, um, I'm just, you know, so grounded in my work that I'm like, man, I got to pay tribute. So that's why I use the slogan ancestors, wild just dreams. What would you say is one of those moments that like kind of hit you and made you feel like, dang, I'm really here right now. Like a moment that, that humbled you or made you just understand like the progress that, um, that you've made in your life and in your creative endeavors, man. Man, I've, I've, I've been blessed to say I've been in a lot of moments where I'm like, I can't, really understand how this is happening for me or even feeling like I've worked so hard and this is what it feels like. Um, But I would say one moment that really stood out to me and I just had a chance to meet up with some of my high school teammates this past weekend. Um, This is the 10 year anniversary of us winning our high school championship Mm. uh, after being in a 32 year drought. And I remember that whole off season and you know what I'm, I actually don't remember most of that off season uh, to correct myself. I felt so compelled and even like quote unquote possessed by like, this is where I want to be. This is like how I need to go about it. I was praying so much. I was working so hard, but I remember the moment where I was like, wow, we won a championship. And then immediately following that, I earned my first college scholarship. And I, mm. I just couldn't, I, I just felt like I couldn't believe that these things were happening for me. And more importantly, it was like, wow, like that's what happens when you put your trust, belief, not just in yourself, but in your work. You put Mm -hmm. your trust and beliefs in a higher power. So those were moments where I felt like I just was overcame by the moment. And those were those that was probably the moment where, like, I really understood, like, what I'm capable of and what prayer, belief and just hard work um, can put you in and put you in positions like that. But um, I mean, most recently, I would say the premiere of my my most recent film kingdom i got a chance to show it in harlem at the schaumburg center so the schaumburg center been in harlem for over 100 years um you've had some of the earliest black arts um whether it was theaters or films or playwrights um or actors like chadwick boseman um they all were in harlem studying in the schaumburg center and i got a chance to be there premiering my film in front of a sold out crowd of over 120 people um that was one of the most incredible moments I ever felt just because I got a chance to not only be in that space where once again, my ancestors put in the work creatively and to push the culture forward, but I had a chance to have my friends, my families, people in the community come out and support me mm-hmm. and show that we believe in you. You're behind, we're behind you. And that was a moment where I was like, wow, this is, this felt so surreal. So I would say, you know, that was probably most recently a moment where I was like, wow, this is what it feels like to be supported. And, you know, I, I would say those are, those were probably two moments that really stand out to me. Mm. So, so get him a, um, basically just an overview of the documentary and what kind of inspired you to do the documentary kingdom. Well, Kingdom is a documentary about the second oldest street ball tournament in the world behind uh, the notorious Rucker Park. Um, mm-hmm. Kingdom is in Harlem, about two miles away from Rucker Park. But this tournament hadn't got hadn't gotten so much notoriety like Rucker Park, um, not because they didn't have elite basketball players. But this tournament is in the middle of one of the most dangerous projects in Harlem. And it's mm-hmm. been that way um, since its founding 40 years ago. So the founder of the tournament. Uh, Terry Honcho Cooper, he had reached out to me via Facebook and he said, I love your film. Somebody uh, recommended you. Uh, I would love for you to come out and, you know, do a documentary on our tournament. It was it was very vague at first. And I didn't know if I really wanted to take on a project like that just because it was so last minute. 
And I understood the magnitude of the tournament, although I never got a chance to go. Mm. And the tournament, um, I, I, st- I stepped into the projects and I got a chance to see what that tournament meant to that community. And from there, I said, you know, this is a project that I would love to take on. I would love to be able to tell this story. So uh, that's why I really wanted to tell that story. And from there, um, I really was like, all right, how can I encapsulate what this tournament is? Um, The founder, Terry Cooper, had asked me um, to really not only show what this tournament is, but show where they were before over their 40 years. So he gave me 150 VHS tapes. And he had asked me to look at all these tapes. So mm. these tapes dated back to 1984. Mm. Um, so I got a chance to see my community back in the 80s, um, watch footage of it in the 90s also, and then the early 2000s, and then mix that in with what I filmed last summer. So the premise of the story was to not only show what this basketball tournament was over the last 40 years, but also show the contributions of this man, uh, Terry Cooper, Um, during that time, he is from those projects, but more importantly, he just really wanted to something that these people in the community could come to during the summer, three days out of the week, um, and just enjoy basketball. So he brought in people like P Diddy, Dame Dash, once sponsored the tournament, Tiana Taylor got her start in the tournament by performing at halftime. Um, Mm. I'm sure y'all in the West coast, I mean, in the Midwest had heard of like, no music when everybody's clapping at like the party, yeah, like no yeah, yeah, music. Yeah. But in the documentary and what I came to learn after interviewing people, that was created at this basketball tournament. Mm. That happened because, and you'll see, hopefully people will see in the documentary how it happened. Um, I don't want to give it away, but that was that was created during a weekend at the tournament where yeah. they didn't have resources. And it speaks to just not only, um, you know, what this tournament was able to do for black culture, but what us as black people were able to do just by improvising um, mm-hmm. and making something out of nothing. So that was why, um, you know, those were some of the things that brought me into one of telling the story. And I had interviewed tons of basketball players, um, people in the community, um, the pioneers in the culture. And yeah, it was it was an amazing journey. Uh, I shot, edited, directed it, color corrected it by myself. I also had support by some amazing individuals in the community that really bought into the vision of uh, telling this story. And yeah, Kingdom's doing uh, extremely well right now. It's been selected for 17 film festivals. Um, it won Best of the Fest at the Hip Hop Film Festival. And um, it's actually going to be showing at Doc NYC next month um, twice. So they gave me two premiere time slots um, at the Village East Cinemas in uh, Soho. So I'm very excited. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, I'm just incredibly blessed to be able to tell stories from my hometown of Harlem, New York. And I wanted to ask you, this is something I wanted to talk about as well, because this is this is interesting to me, this uh, concept of uh, film festivals. What, what's the importance of film festivals? Like uh, if, if it could be related to something like in music, like breaking a, a, a song or something like what, what is the importance of film festivals? Well, the importance of a film festival is really the opportunity to uh, show your works in front of people in a theater setting. Um, you know, in today's age, you, you got the, the whole content wave where everybody's making fast content um, similar to like, you got, I think the best way to compare it is to you, you see in fashion where you got the fast fashion stuff, the stuff looks great. It'll catch your attention. You'll mm-hmm. wear it a couple of times, but then you're ready to move on. Right. Mm-hmm. But you talk about high fashion, they show it at uh, fashion shows. Then it goes into boutique kind of like luxury settings. And then yeah. most of the time these pieces will stay the you know, uh, last the test of time. I think that's, that's the kind of interesting dynamic with film festivals. It's allowing people to see your work in the best setting as possible. Um, and really appreciate the art, whether it's with the sound design, with the surround sound speakers or the widescreen format. Um, and then even the conversations and the ability for us, uh, as filmmakers to, uh, explain our works, to have conversations with our audiences is something that you just don't get, um, by just releasing it, um, on social media or on YouTube. Um, so film festivals allow you to do that. And then in addition to that, uh, many times people are discovered at film festivals. Um, yeah. 
they see your works early, they get a chance to see you speak, and then hopefully they're interested in seeing what you're uh, able to do next. So that's what film festivals are for. It's a platform for independent artists to be able to show their works and uh, showcase who they are. So film execs will be at the, um, the the different film festivals, like looking to see something or like looking to invest in a certain project and they'll just be there watching. Yeah, you'll have some film festivals where execs um, are there. They'll have uh, representatives from companies, production companies. Um, you have distributors, agents. Um, it all depends who's really supporting these festivals. But most of the time, um, as an independent filmmaker, you can invite these people. You can say, hey, I'm screening here. I would love for you to come out and check out the works. Mm. Um, so it's just an opportunity for these people to see you in these space. It's like... Uh, it's like, <laughs> it's funny. I come from a football background, but it's kind of like the scouting combine. You yeah, invite yeah. Them to come out, you know, they, each school got their own combine, but it's like, all right, who are you, who are they looking to recruit to bring it on to their team? Who are they looking to invest in? So it's very similar in that regard. A film festival, <laughs> I might be the first person to say this. It's like a, a scouting combine. Mm. Okay. So, so is it, is it something where everybody can get in or is it like a select is how do you, how does that selection process go? So there's, um, there's tons of film festivals. There's thousands, I would say now, um, all throughout the world. The biggest thing with film festivals is, um, you have to be able to understand what that festival is looking for. Um, some festivals, they're looking for a particular type of film. Uh, so it may not fit, but also, I mean, there's a film festival for everyone. Um, whether it's you got funny films, you have films that may be uh, darker, um, love films. And then some are like all encompassing. So like mine is a documentary. Um, there's tons of film festivals that said no to me just because it didn't fit their criteria for that year. Mm. or um, it just wasn't something that they thought was adequate and that's okay. But um, that's never stopped me from submitting to them and then finding a platform or a festival that's like, Hey, this will work for you guys. So um, really it's, it's, it's tons of platforms where you can submit films, uh, your films through and to these festivals, but um, there is no real requirement or there's no particular festival you should submit to. I think the most important thing is just getting your works in front of people and allowing yourself to have an audience so you think the most uh, effective uh, way of just learning how to direct and, and, and produce is actually getting into it and doing it? Because I know you talked about like the people making content, you know, and, and, and not in large forms. But do you think the education is important or is it more important to practice it or is it a little bit of both? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both or a lot of both. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, you got to be able to create works so you can go through your own trial and error to understand what works for you. And in addition to that, I think the education side is that you have to understand what's happened before you and what's mm. currently happening in the industry. So mm. I think there is no one or the other, but both are just so important in your growth as a creative and as a filmmaker. So I would say, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that are self-taught, but the self-taught people are very educated too. Mm. So that's a that's a big misconception that, oh, uh, this filmmaker never went to film school or this director or writer just started writing. No, they they started writing, they went through trial and error, but more importantly, they studied the craft. Yeah. So it, it isn't a thing of that you just came upon it and you just got great. You put in the work and gradually you'll you'll see improvements um i'm now in year eight of being a filmmaker I, I started independently i was in undergrad i took maybe two film classes but I, I studied public relations um and that paid its dividends in me understanding how to you know network and showcase my talents but as a filmmaker i had to watch a ton of movies i had to do internships i had to go to film festivals in hopes of becoming a better filmmaker so that was my process but I mean, I have tons of friends that have learned so many different ways, um, so many unorthodox techniques. But the biggest thing was how do they communicate and how do they um, tell the stories that they want to tell? So talk about the Nate Parker Foundation, um, just working with him, because 
he's such an interesting figure in my opinion, man. Um, I I love him. Like, I just feel like he should be. Uh, man, he he's just he's 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 an icon in our culture, yeah. man. And I feel like uh, he has that mystique factor because he doesn't do a lot of press, you know, but he does a lot of work, especially behind the scenes nowadays. But um, just talk about meeting him and what you learned in um uh, his his film program. Yeah, um, Nate is that's my big bro, man. He we met. Um, in 2016, he had uh, selected me to be a part of the Nate Parker Foundation. Um, so just briefly, the Nate Parker Foundation is a foundation based in um, cultivating the next generation of Black storytellers, um, primarily focused in people that are in high school and uh, college. But he invites around 30 people, men and women, to a university. Previously, it used to be at Wiley College. Now it's at um, Norfolk State University. And for a week, all 30 of us with various levels and understanding of film and the film industry come together and create a short film. And they break us up into different groups, whether you're a director, writer, producer, um, actor, cinematographer, and you choose those. And that's the group you'll be in for the week. And we'll learn from uh, people of color in the industry, whether they're writers like Rada Blank or directors like Kasim Basir, um, or even, you know, producers like Caution Vandiver, and we'll learn from them during that time. And they'll kind of guide us as we create our own short film over that week as a collective. And um, the Nate Parker Foundation is now in year eight of doing it. Some that's with his movie Birth of a Nation. So it speaks to his character. He was the first person to have that big of a deal at Sundance to have his film bought by uh, 21st Century Fox. And mm. the first thing he immediately did was, I want to start a summer film institute where I can cultivate the next generation of Black storytellers so that we can control the narrative on how we're portrayed. And that speaks to his character. Um, he's he's played a big role in me making decisions career-wise on what would make me better. And more importantly, um, what will help me grow not only as a man in this industry, but more so what will help me grow as a person that will hopefully reach back for others. And mm. uh, yeah, he, he's been incredible. I got a chance to meet him that summer. And then from there, he just, he just remained a, a mentor, a big brother um, and a guy that I know will always have my back. So I'm, I'm definitely grateful for my relationship with Nate. And uh, I'm, I'm just glad he's able to still tell his stories, man. He's, He's unapologetically black and he's unapologetically um, going to be able to voice his his uh, the stories that he wants to tell in this industry for a long time. So I'm excited to see um, the next couple of works he's doing. I know he has some work, um, some projects in the work with uh, his new company, Mansa, as well as um, his last film, American Skin, did very well. Yeah. On the independent section uh, and sector on Amazon and it's aspirational and inspiring um, for me as an independent filmmaker as well. Yeah, he's legendary, man. Legendary. When I saw him in The Great Debaters, I was like, man, I watched that as a kid, man. I was like, mm -hmm. man, as a child, I was just like, man, this is this is something right here. I, I just love uh, I love his acting. I love his presence. But um, especially just like you said, the type of stories that he tells and the type of um, imagery and the message that he pushes, man, like it's. That those are the type of people who I love and respect, man. People who like push the needle forward, man, in like a different Absolutely. type of way. And I think a lot of people don't understand that it's programs out there to help creatives and bring them together like that. Like I didn't know a lot about programs like that. You, you know, uh, another thing though, too, I, I'll mention. Well, there's programs that aspire to do it, and then there's programs that like do it. Mm. And I would say the thing with like the Nate Parker Foundation is they're able to do it at a level where they're really helping like bring people together and the ability to bring in. And I, I can't highlight this enough, the ability to bring in people from all different backgrounds um, to a space and create for a week is something I, I still today haven't seen from pioneers in the industry that are black, or even pioneers in the industry that are of any ethnicity. So, I mean, to, to see what he's been able to do is something that like, I hope more people and more people with uh, influence and uh, the finances are able to, or hopefully are willing to do. Um, so, I, I mean, it's, it's just so incredible. And there are programs out there, but I think the biggest uh, biggest thing that we have to do is put our support behind people that are doing the work mm. uh, so that more people are compelled to do it. 
So what would you say is the key? Because that, that's interesting. Cause I, I hear, I hear that a lot, you know, like a lot of people can have the resources to do it, but yeah. I feel like the person who leads it is like key. Like, yeah, you feel like it's just the way he orchestrated the way he bring. Cause it, it's yeah. so essential for like a leader to like set the tone for everything, like to break the ice, to make sure everybody's like, yo, we a team for this week that we all together. We a team like that. We got a project we working towards yeah. to go similar to football or me. I play basketball, but it's just like when 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 the captain like lets you see the dream or the coach, he 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 you he gets you to understand the goal and the dream that everybody buys in. Yeah. You know, the and I would be remiss not to mention that Nate isn't doing it alone. He has yeah. an incredible staff that bought into his vision. Um, Brian Favors, uh, he's he's the director of the Nate Parker Foundation, but he puts everything together and in motion in in respect in regards to Nate's vision for it. So, you know, I think the biggest thing is getting those people that um, understand things that you don't as far as putting together, mm. uh, whether it's an institute, a conference or your nonprofit and allowing these people that do the work to really step forward and represent you. It's a trust factor there as well. So I think the biggest thing for like people that aspire, and you know, these, these icons and these big public figures to do things like this, um, they got to be willing to allow people that are already doing the work to represent them and that trust factor and then put put the money behind them, allow them to do the work and trust that they're going to represent you at the highest level. Mm. Yeah. And, and and I was saying, uh, I just think it's important for people to know about these type of programs because um, it's definitely something that I didn't know about. Um, and one of my mentors was actually telling me about how they have writing camps and all these different writing mm -hmm. programs that you can like sign up for and stuff. Um, because uh, he does a lot. He's a film producer himself, so he does a lot of big films. He he produced the film It and a couple other big films. But uh, oh, no. he was just telling me, um, like, because I, I, I've i been writing this story, you know, that I wanted to turn into a script. And uh, he's just like, oh, yeah, you need to read this book, this book, this book, this book. And then when you're ready, then, you know, you might want to uh, check out these writing programs. Um, and he was just giving me so much game. And um, I just think uh, stuff like that is just so important for us to know, because a lot of times we don't even know these things exist, you know, like that they have do a writing program and fly you out here for two weeks and then you come together and they'll teach you all these different techniques. Like, I, yeah. we don't know that this stuff exists, especially from the community. No, no, a lot it's of a lot of, and, and it's because a lot of these opportunities, especially in film, it's film is just like such an elitist art form. And I yeah. say that every time, like, and even like, I didn't want to go to film school for such a long time because I was just like, man, it's such a privileged thing to do. And then also I didn't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. So yeah. when the opportunity came for me to be able to go to school uh, by the grace of God for free, mm. um, I understood like this is an opportunity that come a dime a dozen. And, you know, for film, um, like I mentioned, it's it's so difficult to try to say these opportunities exist when they're for thousands of dollars and we understand the financial barriers that black people face. Mm. And it's so difficult to put ourselves in a position financially to go chase a dream. And, mm. uh, you know, there, there are some programs out there, but I, I think, yeah, it's tough, man. And it's, it would be so remiss and ignorant for me to say that, yeah, it's possible, but understand people's financial situation, bro. And I, I think the biggest thing though, too, now, like, you can be educated and work on your craft through the internet. This is our mm. this is our new renaissance. The internet was the new opportunity for us to tap into so many resources. And you've done an amazing job in that fact, creating platforms, um, being able to speak on tons of topics and myself as well that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to know just by being in school or walking in my neighborhood. Um, I wasn't exposed to those things. So the internet became the great, the, the great uh, kind of balancing uh, equalizer yeah equalizer and that's that's something that you know hopefully people aren't uh taking for granted in this whole grand scheme of thing of wanting to be a filmmaker or wanting to be a writer or wanting to be um an intellectual in any regard like these resources are here um but i think another thing is just being guided on which way to go mm -hmm. um it's so important as well so how was the experience different having experience and then going back to school then when you first started in undergrad and you didn't might not had as much experience, but you're taking these yeah. classes and you learn these different things. And I, I asked because um, 
I remember my last year of college when I was in my journalism classes, I had had, I already had like a year and a half of experience of interviewing people. Mm. And the way that I was learning things was different. Cause it's like, Oh yeah, I, I do that. I didn't know it was called unstructured questions. I didn't know it was structured and unstructured and all these different things. And when I'm reading these different books, it's just making everything that we do make sense. So yeah. how, how, how was your experience? Well, my experience is, uh, I mean, I'm currently in the middle of it and I would say, I said this in my interviews, like I've learned to be a filmmaker through through just trial and error. And I took mm. on so many unorthodox techniques and storytelling and creating films that I don't mind the way I do it. But I also understand like as a film director, you got to be able to communicate and to communicate, you also got to be able to understand what you're talking about. And that's perfectly fine. And I think like, Prior, I was so used to just like pushing and putting in so much work and working hard, which is great. But now that I'm back in school, like I understand my purpose. I understand what type of stories I want to tell. I understand um, what I really want to learn about. Mm. Um, it's so important, especially in grad school now, like I'm, I have the ability to I have to take core classes. But now I have the ability to choose um, a plethora of other classes that I feel are going to support me and um, help me grow as a filmmaker. So I think me going back to school, I have so much more uh, intent and purpose in everything that I'm doing. And I think that's the biggest difference as opposed to just creating. Um, it's now I'm creating with an even more focused intent and purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and talk talk about um, job shadowing, interning, and just the importance of that and how to go about being successful in that. Because I know you had this problem. Well, you had this powerful quote on a, a different podcast that I seen you on. Um, and you was talking about the hardest thing to do is be a straight black man and apply for an assistant job. And that's deep. And and that, that hit me because I was just like, dang, I've yeah. applied for so many internships um, in different things um, just to try to job shadow somebody who's definitely into uh, something that I would be interested in. And it just didn't go through. But why do you think um, there's a divide or there's some type of tension there? And what do you think you is the best way to go about like combating that? I think, well, I know <laughs> the most difficult thing in like a lot of these spaces, whether they're, you know, hierarchy spaces with black people or it's hierarchy spaces with white folks, um, is that many times a confident black man or, you know, mm, straight black man, which I yeah. said on that show. And it's the fact that a lot of us are, we're a threat many times you see it with like these movements like we're characterized as being like oh man i shouldn't say this to that person or people feel nervous in the things they got to say around us um which is okay I, I don't i've never backed down from being who i am in these spaces and bringing how i've been raised and my confidence that's been instilled in me in these spaces but i also understand like to some people they're afraid of that and you talk about an industry where you kind of got to be docile. You mm -hmm. kind of got to learn, understand to take a back seat because you ain't like, although you're a part of the team, you don't make no decisions. Mm. <laughs> and uh, mm. understanding that even for like, you know, some of my friends, when I explain like, look, I'm in the room, I might get yelled at, but I got to be coachable. I got to be like, you know what? You're right. What's the goal here? Mm. And I got to understand like, there's a job to be done. There's a lot of money behind stuff. And I got to be able to take a back seat. So I understand that like many times, like at least the way black men are portrayed in society, we're not portrayed to be people that can be on a team or people that can be able to work effectively with other groups. And that's not the case. Mm. Um, and that's many times why it's so difficult for, you know, black men to get jobs in these corporate spaces, because there's this stigma that we can't work in groups. We're not, quote unquote coachable and you see it in mm. sports too they say that you're not coachable like yeah. all that stuff is bs they say it all the time with black quarterbacks like is he coachable like it's crazy no we're talented um we're willing to learn and more importantly i think we're an incredible asset to any group and space that we're in because we are many times the missing piece to these diverse rooms that's needed um so i, I that's kind of been my experience and i think like it's so important that like Black men, young black men understand um, that you have to be in these spaces. We can't do it alone. We're not mm -hmm. we're not the smartest. We haven't 
And we haven't been had that privilege to be in these rooms and like learn. My pops, my pops works for the post office. He's never been in an executive room with people that are making multi-million dollar decisions. He hasn't been mm-hmm. in a room with executive writers, directors, producers. Like, and I had to understand through these internships, like hey, I'm not there yet. And I have to learn from these people. And I wouldn't say, and I used this word earlier, um, docile, like I, I I wouldn't say I had to be docile, but I had to be willing to commit to this journey. I had to mm. understand, like, I'm going to be in these rooms one day, but like these people understand more than me. And the fact that they were willing to even take a shot on me to being in this internship or for me willing to be an assistant to a director or an assistant to an executive producer, they're willing to have me in this space. So I got to take advantage of it. I got to represent for the next black man that's applying for this job, because now like, yeah. you know, hopefully, um, and I'm thankful that you brought that up, that other people say, oh, all right, I could be in that space. I could be an assistant. What's the, you know, and the assistant behind being an, uh, the stigma behind being an assistant is that like, you gotta be soft. You can't, mm-hmm. you know, nah, you gotta be willing to learn, bro. You gotta be willing yeah. to learn what it takes to be a leader. And, you know, you got people like Diddy, you got people, I mean, you got tons of people in the industry that had to be assistants, even producers like Ye had to be in the studio chilling for a bit. He had to shut yeah. up, take a back seat until he understood what it took until he could take his ideas to becoming a billionaire. And that's what it takes. I mean, in any industry, whether you're in entertainment, you're in business, you got to be willing to um, go through the process and um, understand the necessary steps to becoming uh, a leader. And, you know, that's that's what I would say, being an assistant, being in internships, you're understanding um, how the business works, how the industry uh, is and how you should navigate these spaces. And hopefully these things lead you up to hopefully being in a position of leadership um, at the end of it. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's so deep because it makes me think about... Uh... It makes me think about the fact that people don't understand that you really just have to be able to understand where you're at and understand the uh, context behind the industry that you're in. And when you uh, just raise the reference of your father, like it made me think about some sometimes when I was doing internships in college and my family members would be like, man, you're not getting paid. You've been doing it for this many months or you've been doing it for a year or two and you ain't getting paid. You ain't. Doing it. But I'm just like, you don't understand the context and you don't understand while I'm here, you know. And sometimes, like you said, some if you've never really been in a certain type of environment, in a certain type of room, it's all going to seem foreign to a lot of people. And you might get a lot of advice and people telling you that you're doing the wrong thing or like, man, they taking advantage of you. And it's like, nah, they're not taking advantage. I'm getting what I got to get. It just may not look like, you know, you think it would look like because I'm, I'm it's just a different room. But I'm trying to get to some place we ain't never been. So now it's going to look a little different. It's, it's going to look like it's never looked, you know, so Absolutely. that's deep, man. And, you know, our our generation and just our people, we've been so infatuated with instant gratification, especially at a young age. And the privilege of other groups is that they are not in a rush. They'll go through Mm -hmm. all these different career shifts. They'll have the privilege of staying at home or their parents paying for their housing and they don't have to worry about money. But we've always, as as, um, Black people, had this pressure that we got to create right now. We got to make the best album ever right now. We got to, or it, or it's all or nothing. Like that's so much pressure on ourselves that it's taken away from our journey to actually grow. And in my, in my, you know, I'm 27 now. I'm, I, I stress this to my friends so much, like, man, we're doing exactly what we need to be doing to be where we want to be in the future. Mm. We're doing so much more than what we've seen our parents do. And that's mm-hmm. something to celebrate every chance we get. And we understand that, like, look, we ain't where we want to be yet, but if we keep putting in this work, we'll hit the financial strides and career strides we want to be and what we want to be in the future um, if we just stay consistent. So um, it ain't.